Good morning. Morning. How are you? Good. Quiet still. <laughs> Figured after all that, you would have been a little bit more awake. Uh, I want to take just a moment, and if you're a first-time guest here, or maybe you've not been here in a while, we want to tell you that we are so glad you're with us. We love you, and we hope that this morning you have felt welcomed and loved. And so, we're glad you're here. And uh, if you wasn't here last week, uh, we're in this uh, series of messages called The Chain Breaker. And uh, if you wasn't here last week and you want to hear last week's message, you can go to the church's Facebook page or you can uh, get on YouTube and search Bond Baptist Church. And uh, it's on there and you can watch it and uh, you can keep up with the series that way. And uh, what we learned last week is that we all have some baggage. We all have some things in our life that we wish we didn't have. Uh, maybe those are... Uh, addictions, maybe their regrets, maybe it's shame, um, but we all have some chains and uh, ultimately we all want to get rid of our chains and um, that's what this series is all about. We are on a journey uh, to a place called freedom and last week we uh, found out that uh, we all have a problem that we cannot fix and uh, if you were here last Last week, then probably sometime this week, you bumped into that thing in your life, whether it's regret or shame or addiction, and uh, when you bumped into that, you were supposed to say, I have a problem that I cannot fix on my own. And I hope that you've done that this week. Um, but as we continue our, our journey to freedom this morning, uh, I want us to go to John chapter 5. If you have your Bible or a mobile device on it, uh, if you don't have your Bible, there is a uh, gold Bible in the back of your pew, uh, probably, hopefully. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, you are welcome to that Bible. Uh, that's yours, and you can take it home. And uh, if you pick up that gold Bible, we're in page 1014, so 1014. But before we get into it, let's pray one more time, how about that? God, we, uh, we come to you this morning and God, we are believing for freedom today. God, we are believing that chains will be broken, that people will be set free, and that today will be a life change for somebody. God, I, I pray that we wouldn't leave this place the way we came in, but God, that today would be different for us. God, that today... Uh, we could encounter you in a new and a real way. God, we love you so much, and it's through your son Jesus we pray. Amen. Alright, so uh, last week we were in John chapter 4, uh, talking about the woman uh, in Samaria at the well. And this week we're going to be in John chapter 5, and I want to give you a little bit of background before we move forward uh, into the text. Um, we, we find Jesus and his disciples. He's got these 12 young guys, uh, about 18, 19 years old, we think, and they're running around with him and learning how to do life with Jesus. And uh, Jesus sometimes takes them into some uncomfortable places. He sometimes takes them into some um, hard situations. And uh, that's where we found them last week. And... Uh, now Jesus has left Galilee and has come to Jerusalem to celebrate a Jewish feast. And uh, they enter uh, Jerusalem at this place called the Sheep Gate. And the Sheep Gate was where uh, the sheep would come through when it was Passover time, when they were about to do their religious sacrifices. And so all the sheep would pass through this gate going towards the temple. And uh, is in the northwest corner of Israel, and next to this gate, there's this uh, large pool, and we know it is the pool of Bethesda. Uh, this pool had five huge porches around it, um, and it was called the pool of Bethesda. And uh, the rumor about this pool was that an angel would come down occasionally. And stir in the pool, and the first one in got healed. And uh, what we know now is 
that uh, it wasn't actually an angel coming and stirring it. Uh, that was a wives' tale of the day. And it was actually a hot spring that would boil up every now and then. And, um, and when people would get in it, it would help their bodies and they would feel like they were healed. So there, these people thought that this pool would heal them if they could get in it. And uh, so as a result of that, there were people at this pool all the time. And some people lived at this pool. Some people stayed at this pool all the time just waiting on the water to stir up so that they could have their chance to be healed. These people, some of them were blind. Some of them were paralyzed. Some of them couldn't walk. And uh, they all just waited around this pool waiting on the water to stir so that they could be healed. And we don't really know how many people were at the pool this particular day. We could imagine that there was a lot of them. And uh, just if somebody said that if you got an anvil pool and uh, you could get healed, then there would be people lined up waiting to get in an anvil pool, wouldn't they? And it's the same thing today. And we find Jesus walking into this this pool, this area, this uh, pool of Bethesda. And when they walk in, him and his disciples, they see all these sick people. And uh, let's just say that there were 500 people. I don't know how many people were there, but let's just say this day there were 500 people. You would expect that when Jesus walked into an area with 500 sick people, that when Jesus left, there would be 500 well people. 500 people would have been healed, but... You see, Jesus rarely does what we expect him to do. So we have expectations on Jesus. And sometimes the reason we get disappointed in the faith is because we have expectations on Jesus, but Jesus rarely does what we expect him to do. And so Jesus and his disciples, he, they walk in under these huge porches. And Jesus walks by 499 sick people to this one particular man. And we don't know a lot about this man. We don't even know what was wrong with him. He could have been blind. He could have been lame. He could have been paralyzed. We don't know. But Jesus could have literally been stepping over sick people to get to this one man. That's not an image we have oftentimes of Jesus, but could I tell you this morning that Jesus is not fair. So everybody doesn't get the same treatment with Jesus. Some people get healed and other people don't, and we don't know why. And so Jesus walks by and probably steps over many of these 499 people. And he walks up to this man, and all that we know about this man is that he has had his condition for 38 years. 38 years. That's a long time. To have this condition, to have this health problem. And we don't know how long this man has sat by this pool, but it's very likely... That he may have sat by this pool his entire time that he had this condition. So he may have very well been there 38 years. And so think about sitting by the same pool day in and day out for 38 years. And he had this expectation that one day, I, I, I can just see him and he's dreaming that one day I'm going to be laying by the pool and that water's going to stir and I'm going to be the first to get in and I'm finally going to get my healing. I'm finally going to be well. I'm finally going to have this thing in my life dealt with. But evidently, his condition prevented him from getting in the pool. 
And so I don't know how many people he saw walk away from there healed. But you know that he had led, led a disappointing life. That every time the water stirred, he thought it was his time. He tried to get in and just couldn't seem to get there. He tried every human way possible to get in that water so that he could finally be healed. And I don't know how many times he was second place, but I could imagine that there was a few times when he was close. And he thought, if I'd just been a second faster, if I could have just been a little better, if I could have been a little closer, then I would have got my healing. And this man laid there day by day on his mat, feeling bad for himself. I'm sure some days he just felt like giving up. He felt like, I'm never going to have this thing in my life dealt with. I'm going to lay by this pool for the rest of my life. So he would day in and day out. I don't know how often this pool stirred up, but he would lay by this pool dreaming of the day that would be his day. Jesus walks into this situation, and I wonder if you have a friend who when they walk into a situation, they are bound to make it awkward. Like you don't want to take this friend into public because you know they're going to ask the question that's going to make the situation awkward. Have you got the friend? Do you, do you know who I'm talking about? If you don't have that friend, you are that friend and you need to stop. So, Jesus was that friend. When he walked into a situation, he was going to make it awkward. He was going to make it uncomfortable. And in, in verse 6, there's this man and he's laying there, been laying there 30 years, dreaming of the day he'd be healed. And Jesus walks up to him, and this is what happens. It says, when Jesus saw him, in verse 6, lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? <laughs> really, Jesus? That's the only question you have for him? Like, how about what's your name? Do you want to be healed? And if I was this man, I would be extremely frustrated with Jesus right now. Like, really, Jesus? Do you think I come here for the view? Do you think I just come here to hang out by this pool? I've been here 38 years, Jesus. What do you think? Really, Jesus? Do you think... What, what are you thinking, Jesus? Are you thinking at all? I'm by this pool and everybody here wants to be healed. What do you mean, do I want to be healed? Why would you even ask me that? What are you thinking, Jesus? And if it was me, I probably would have pulled Jesus to the side and been like, Jesus, I know that you're trying to do real good, but let's stop asking these kinds of questions. You're making them feel uncomfortable. But... Jesus knew that just because he was laying beside the pool didn't necessarily mean that he wanted to be healed. Because it would be easier for this man, his life would be easier if he just kept laying by the pool. Jesus knew that life would be easier if this man never got healed. This man had laid there 38 years and he probably knew everybody at the pool. It's where his friends were. His friends were connected with his situation. This man probably lived there. He probably ate there. And even though this man had this condition that he wanted to be Rid of Jesus knew that life would be harder for this man if he got healed. And so Jesus says, do you really want to be healed? 
Do you really want to be well? I think Jesus was saying, are you sure about this? Are you sure you want to be healed? Because the fact of the matter was that everything in this man's life was going to change when he got healed. Everything this man knew, everything this man was familiar with, was going to change when he got healed. And this man responds to this question that Jesus poses. And he, he responds the way I think you and I would. It says in verse 7, The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. This man had excuses. He said, well, I've tried before, Jesus. I try, I've tried to get this condition fixed on my own. I've tried to do it on my own. I've tried to fix my situation by myself. But it's always somebody else's fault. Well, I would have my condition fixed, but I've tried before and failed. And I, I could just imagine that as Jesus is having this conversation with this man, all those close calls where the man almost got in first began to run through his mind. And this man began to recall all the times that it was close but no cigar. Where maybe the other person's foot hit just a second before his did. And you know, that's the thing about religion. Religion will always say, if you're better, stronger, faster, smarter, then you can be healed. But this man provided stories and excuses. He said, Jesus, I would... But I've tried every way. I've tried everything that I could do to get healed, but I can't seem to get healed. It must just not be meant for me to get healed. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And so today, probably, you have a story just like this man's. So maybe you've not been laying by the pool with your condition. Maybe your condition is not paralysis. Maybe your condition is not being blind. But maybe your condition is an addiction. Maybe it's an addiction to drugs or maybe it's an addiction to alcohol or to pornography or to sex or to food or to other people's approval. Maybe it's fear or maybe it's shame, maybe it's regret, but we all have a condition. We all have problems in our life, we all have baggage, we all have chains, right? We all have things in our life that disgust us, that we wish we could stop, but we just can't seem to stop. And we've tried all the things, we've tried all the tricks, we've done everything that we could do. We've bought self-help books, we've uh, paid for plans, we've got friends and told them about it. We've tried everything in the world to shed this baggage, but we can't seem to do it. We've tried classes and we've tried counseling. We've exhausted every single possibility. And we've come to the place where we think, maybe it's just not meant for me to be free. Maybe, maybe it's just not meant for me to get healed. Maybe it's just not meant for me to be free from this thing. And Jesus asks us, asks us today that same hard question that he asked that man that day. Do you want to be well? 
I'm not asking, are you sick of your problem? I'm not asking if you're tired of being sick. My question for you today is, do you want to be well? Really? Do you want to be well? You may feel like the answer's obvious today, just like that man did. Are you joking, Jesus? Of course I want to be well. I've dealt with this for five years. I've dealt with this for ten years. I've tried every trick in the book, Jesus. Of course I want to be well. But the thing about our chains, the thing about our addictions, our conditions is some of us have had them so long they've become like family. You despise them, but you can't imagine life without them. And so, our, our thing, our baggage, our chain, our addiction, it's become engraved in our lives. And we can't imagine what life would look like without them. And so, are you willing to do life without that thing? Are you willing... To leave your friends like this man did? Change the way you live? Because this man experienced this and you will too if you decide that you want to be well. When you say, yes, I want to be well, everything will begin to change. Your whole life will look differently when you experience the freedom that Jesus is offering you today. Jesus, I think more than asking the question, do you want to be healed? I think that Jesus was asking, are, are you willing to deal with what happens when you get healed? Are you willing to maybe lose your friends? Are you willing to lose your way of life? Are you willing to be shaken to the core? Are you sure you want to be healed? Are you sure you want to be healed? You may say this morning, we all have our excuses. You may say, I've tried everything. I know that I can't be free. You may say this morning... I made those wrong cho choices. I've done those things and I deserve that regret. And if you're real spiritual this morning, you may say, that's just my cross to carry. I don't think so. You may say, nobody in my family could get free of this thing. And so I guess I'll just have to deal with it till I die. You've given up like this man did. You've given up on God's ability to set you free. Maybe the doctor told you it was untreatable. And you just settled for that. You just said, well, if the doctor said it was untreatable, then it must be untreatable. And I'll just have to deal with that thing. Until I die. But I have better news than that this morning. It doesn't matter what your excuse is this morning. It doesn't matter what your condition is this morning. It doesn't matter how long you've had the condition. It don't matter how long you've been addicted. It doesn't matter how many times you've tried before and failed, it doesn't matter how many times you fell on your face this morning, it doesn't matter how hopeless and desperate your situation may look, there is a man named Jesus who can come into your situation and when he comes in, everything will begin to change. Everything will begin to change. Your situation will look different when Jesus enters that situation. 
If you would stop trying to get free, if you would stop trying to get in the pool long enough by your own power, by your own willpower, you say, if I could just grit harder, work harder, do better, then I could get free. But that's left you laying by the pool in a hopeless situation. The fact of the matter is this morning is that you are not strong enough to beat that thing. And you know that. You've experienced that. You're not smart enough to beat that thing. You're not witty enough to overcome it. But what I want you to know this morning is that there is a man named Jesus. A man named Jesus who came and he died 2,000 years ago. He lived a perfect life. That means his life looked much different than yours did. He lived a perfect life. And he was killed on the cross. He didn't die for your sin. He died as your sin. Your sin died the day Jesus died. That thing that you've been struggling with, that thing that you've been fighting, I just want to let you know today that it died when Jesus died. And it has no power over you today. Amen. And they laid my Jesus in a tomb because they thought he was defeated. They thought it was over with. They thought the situation was hopeless and there was no fix. But Jesus, he didn't stay in that tomb any longer. He didn't stay in that tomb. But on the third day, he raised up from the grave. And on that day, he became the chain breaker. And no matter what your chains are today, it doesn't matter how many times you've tried, it doesn't matter how many times you've failed, He is today the chain breaker. Nothing is too big and nothing is too small. Because He can break every single chain that you face today. They're going to come up and sing and we're going to have a time to worship right now. But I want you to know, you can't do this on your own. You can't break your chains on your own and you found that out. You found out that every time you tried to get into the pool... Every time that you tried to fix it on your own, every time you tried to make things right, you just fell on your face, didn't you? You might have you might have beat it for a week. You might have uh, fixed it for two months. You might have done all right for a month or, or or for six months or for a year. But ultimately, you found that those chains might have been loosened, but they wasn't broken. And so today. I believe that Jesus is going to set the captive free. I believe that He's bringing the dead back to life. And I believe that He's going to bring some victory into your situation today. The victory that you've been trying for. The victory that you thought you could get on your own and you couldn't. I believe today that Jesus will set us free in this place. Let me pray for us. God, we love you today. And God, we realize that we cannot do this on our own. <coughs> we are not strong enough on our own. God, we do not know what we need to know to be able to beat our situation. 
But God, we are thankful today that you are the chain breaker. That even when our situation is hopeless and there's nothing we can do about it, when we have problems that we cannot fix, you can. You can, Jesus. And we believe that in this moment, God, you are going to resurrect lives and that you are going to break chains of addiction. God, we thank you this morning for the resurrected King. In Jesus' name, amen. You can